To resist or not to resist, that is the question that every victim is faced with. When a bad guy decides to mark you out as a victim and takes swift, decisive action when they choose the time and place to attack you, whether their intention is homicide, rape, a simple robbery, home invasion, or something else, what do the statistics and studies say that you need to know about how you should make an informed decision about how you should react. Do you go along with your attackers? Do you try to physically resist? Or are you better off physically resisting with a firearm? My name is Tom Grieve, ex-state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Let's get into it. So we're all just showered and barraged with phrases like run, hide, fight. And I swear, I hear a lot of people say something more like run, hide, run. Sometimes, depending upon your physical capability and mental preparation, the level of physical resistance that you can offer may be quite low. And I understand that. But for many people in a given population, what do the studies suggest is your best course of action? Well, first we need to consider the attacker. Who's the bad guy attacking you? According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, a federal bureau aimed at abstracting information about and measuring crime and victims, approximately one in four attackers, or about 26% of all violent crimes, are committed with some type of dangerous weapon. We're talking things like a firearm, a knife, something like that. The crimes we are talking about here, of course, are homicide, sexual assault, robbery, and physical assault, as well as battery. Of those 26% of bad guys who are armed, well under half of them are carrying some type of firearm, or about 10% of bad guys attackers as a whole. Now, I should note, speaking as an ex-state prosecutor as well as a criminal defense attorney, that most of the time, firearms carried are of the lowest quality and sometimes are not even functional. I have a video that I'm gonna be working on talking about underground black markets for firearms to expand on this point for you, but for right now, I'm just gonna park that right there to the reasons why. I, of course, need to stress that times change and different markets will influence how different bad guys will be armed differently at different places at different times. Recall that one high-profile shooting from January 2023 that saw a good Samaritan intervene in a Houston taco joint when a bad guy showed up with a handgun to rob the place, later discovered that the bad guy's handgun turned out to be a BB gun. And this is actually more common than you may think. One study from 1990 estimated that about 15% of armed robbers use toy guns, such as BB guns and air guns during their attacks. Likewise, even if the firearms carried are real, my anecdotal, or as some people these days may say, my lived experience in dealing with these kind of cases and cops is that a fair portion of the time, these firearms are not operable. Fortunately, I can also cite at least one very informal source, namely a cop who looked at the last batch of firearms that his department seized during investigations of crime. And by the way, all my sources are linked in the description box below here. They found that about of the 85 firearms recently taken off the streets during commission of crimes, nine were completely broken down making up about 10% of the firearms that were just utterly inoperable. 17 of the 85, or about 20%, were kind of semi-operable at best due to suffering from excessive malfunctions. We're talking like one in three shots. Lack of proper magazines that fit those same firearms, or internal parts breakage that seriously affected the firearm's ability to reliably function. This combines to a little more than 20% of crime guns actually being used in the street having serious problems with them. Additionally, about 28% of the firearms taken off crime scenes that we're talking about here, just under one in three, were completely unloaded, no ammunition in them. And about 2% of the overall firearms taken from these scenes were actually having the wrong ammunition, the wrong caliber in them. And I've heard from many folks who live and work in some pretty rough neighborhoods and major metropolitan areas that criminals often, by the way, scrape together cash to buy bullets, two, three, five, eight, 10, 12 at a time. We're not talking about walking into a store and buying 50 or 100 or ordering bulk over the internet. Keep in mind, a lot of these people they don't have checking accounts, they don't have credit cards, nothing like that. They're using cash carry and they're getting things as best they can off the street. So hopefully that helps to explain a little bit about how to the uninitiated, these sorts of things actually work. Now, when you add up the inoperable and unloaded firearms, it came out in this particular sample group to be approximately 41% of the firearms seized were non-functional due to either breakage or being unloaded. Only about 27% of the loaded handguns had proper quality ammunition. In other words, we're talking about hollow point ammunition, the type that law enforcement or responsible citizen may be carrying to defend themselves against two-legged threats. When you keep this all in mind, 
it suddenly becomes clear why another national study found that victims in non-fatal attacks suffered 3% gunshot wound rate, meaning that only 3% of survivors of non-fatal attacks from an assailant with a firearm were actually wounded at all. And that is not a small data set of 10 or 12 people. In one 12 month period alone measured by the study, again, linked in the description box below, in one 12 month period, there were 57,000 non-fatal gunshot wounds treated in emergency departments that were tied to being linked from assaults. So we're not talking about suicides or something like that there. Now maybe those statistics cited by the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, that concluded that there are between 500,000 and 3 million defensive gun uses per year start to look a little bit more credible in the context of some of these wound numbers. But that's not what we're here to talk about, so pressing on. But the bottom line, should you fight back against an attacker, whether they are armed or not? Are you statistically better off going along with your attacker or meeting force with force? Well, in a typical lawyer fashion, I have to give you an it depends answer, and here's why. It depends what kind of attack you are facing, and it depends what kind of resistance you are offering. In general, untrained, unarmed resistance will correlate to higher victim injury rates. Also, keep in mind, these are raw statistics taken from across the country where most people are not very proficient with their chosen defense weapon and have limited to no training whatsoever. So this is an opportunity for you to stack the deck in your favor so that you do not fall into the untrained group and you can improve your statistical outcome. But according to the data linked in a survey below, the probability of serious injury during an attack is 2.5 times greater for women who offer no resistance to their attacker compared to women who resist with a firearm. I'll say that again. You are 2.5 times more likely to be seriously injured if you're a woman in an attack if you offer no resistance compared to if you resist with a firearm. But what about if we compare those who resist with a firearm compared to those who resist without a firearm? Well, the survey found that women who resist with a firearm are four times as likely to not be seriously injured compared to those who do resist, but resist without a firearm. So at least according to that study, if you're not gonna be trained, if you're not gonna be prepared, then don't resist physically unless you have a firearm. But of course, the single best thing you can do is be trained, be prepared, martial arts, the whole bit, the whole spectrum. That's the statistically best group you can be in. But I guess that there may be some truth to that old saying that goes, God created man and Sam Colt made them all equal. A firearm is the force equalizer for people who may be weaker, slower, or suffer from some sort of disability, which includes being outnumbered by your attackers. That was about women. How do these statistics look for men? Basically the same, but with a tighter dispersion between resisting with and without a firearm. So men who passively go along with their attackers, which could be the right call in any given case, without offering any kind of resistance are 1.4 times more likely to be seriously injured compared to those who offer resistance by way of a firearm. So I'll say that again, you are 1.4 times more likely to be seriously injured if you go along with your attacker and offer no resistance compared to if you resist with a firearm. The same correlation emerges when we look at what happens when men resist but without a gun compared to when they resist with a gun. Men who resist without a gun are 1.5 times more likely to be seriously injured compared to if they had a gun. So once more, your best statistical category to be in be trained, be educated, be prepared, and carry a firearm. One study conducted by John Lott found that approximately 98% of the time, 98% of the time, when a victim produces a firearm in self-defense, we're not talking about shooting it, simply producing it, displaying it, making its presence known and felt that the bad guy ran away or somehow give up the fight. That's a huge statistical group to be a part of. Guys, if you think this is important, if you want to see other people to see this video, tell the algorithm it's important. Tell me you like to see more videos like this compared to other content. Be sure to hit that like button. Let me know in the comment field below. I do read as many comments as possible. I respond to a lot of them. I look forward to seeing in the comment section. Let's get to some bottom line takeaways and of course our ever popular quote of the day. Some bottom line takeaways. We can do a lot, at least many of us can, to mitigate our chances for being targeted for crime. However, there are many things that we simply cannot control for, for a variety of different perfectly legitimate and understandable reasons, such as where we can afford to live, work, and travel through, to name just three simple ones. 
we are also not the ones making the active decision to initiate a violent force encounter. The bad guy chooses the time and place. What we can choose, what you can choose, aside from those choices above about where we reside, is you can choose what kind of victim you are going to be. What kind of victim is the bad guy going to find? You heard some of the statistics. Which group do you want to be a part of? A quote of the day comes from Friedrich Nietzsche. Quote, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed, end quote. I look forward to seeing the comments section and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.